Hey everybody, it's Paul with Reporting Live from my sofa. I hope y'all are doing great out there. It's a great day on the sofa today. As you saw from the title on the thumbnail, we're going to be reviewing day three of the Brent Christensen trial. Now, as you, if you've been watching this before, you know that this is a federal court case that's going on right now. Uh, there are no cameras or anything like that allowed in the courtroom. So I'm just gonna be reviewing some reporter's notes and kind of making commentary on that. And that's it. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. Okay, so day three, this specific reporter here uh, titles his notes for the day. Uh, Christensen's girlfriend records him for the FBI. So this was very interesting. Now he starts off, and again, he's just kind of documenting what he's seen in the courtroom and whatnot. Uh, and so he says, you know, Christensen's dad enters the courtroom, steps to the side closest to his son, and they tell each other, I love you. And his dad says, stay strong. And Christensen seems to be glad seeing his dad. Now, another thing, and I know I keep saying this, y'all, and I'm going to do this. I want to do something dedicated strictly to how parents handle when their children commit these atrocities. Now, I've seen the doc or by the TED talk from the mother of the Columbine shooter, one of the Columbine shooters. Uh, there was another thing on Amazon Prime, I believe, about a family whose son is serving life for killing his sister, which was very fascinating. Because you sit here and read this, and you're just like, oh my gosh. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, this guy is somebody's son, and, you know, he's going to be there for him. Probably doesn't approve of everything, you know, we would hope. So, anyways, I just thought that was interesting that that was the first thing he wrote down. So, we're going to continue on. Now, before the jury's brought in, the defense makes another, um, uh, declares a mistrial. This is the second time. And essentially says, they say there's no evidence that Christensen killed anyone else other than Zong and says the government presented it as evidence is meant to bias the jury against him. So now if you remember, this is what it gets into. Uh, Christensen's girlfriend had a, a, a wiretap on her and during a conversation where he basically is telling her everything he did he says that Zong was his 13th victim and so the defense is kind of saying and they can't find any proof that that's actually true or not and the defense is essentially trying to say well look that's making the jury biased so on and so forth so you know but the judge isn't having it obviously so let's look at the first witness that was called for the day, and his name is Michael Carter. He is a special agent for the FBI, and he was part of a team that canvassed Champaign County to look for the Black Saturn asterisk. And remember, that is Brent Christensen's car. They had found 18 of them, like owners and whatnot, so they had to go out and search for where these people are and find this car, because it was all over videotape. So he was partnered with a special agent, Joel Smith, during the canvassing. And Carter says that when he went to Tr Christensen's apartment to question him, he says that Christensen said he was aware that a student was missing. And Carter says Brent told him he was sleeping or playing video games on June 9th. So he was just part of that whole first initial contact where, of course, Brent's going to lie about that. I mean, that's just what he would do. Carter says that they obtained surveillance video from the MTD, and when they searched Christensen's apartment in the early morning hours of June 15th, Carter says his team was interested in electronic evidence. So they were coming there probably just to find... I mean, I think that's probably just a standard for these type things to see. Have you been corresponding with this person? You know, just to find out, because most things that people do are on the Internet, let's be honest. So... Uh, apparently they play another video in the courtroom and it's the second interview Christensen had with FBI agents and they're asking him about his activities through the week of June 8th and the 14th in 2017. And in the video, now remember, so let's backtrack real quick, he went and did one video, like one interview with them, and it did not go well. I mean, basically they knew that he did this at this point, but they just didn't have enough evidence. And so he was allowed to leave, but under like major surveillance. So then he willingly comes back in to do another interview why i don't know uh but thank god he did because now you know he's called so anyways uh he says i want christensen says i want to get this cleared up in the video he tells the agent he was with his wife at home on thursday the 8th and that he had a phone interview with wolfram research i procrastinated a bit that kind of stuff christensen said now talking about what he did after he woke up friday morning then what i did next i went to schnooks 
Now that's the video where he is getting a big bottle of rum first thing in the morning. After that, he tells the agents, I was not really in a good mood. My wife was gone. I was lonely, so I went for a drive. Now, remember, he has an open relationship, and his wife, what he's speaking of, had gone on vacation with her new boyfriend to the same place that Christensen and her went on their honeymoon. So, hey, to each their own with the open relationship thing, I can't help but think, you know, the whole thing about I'm going to our honeymoon spot and even letting him know is maybe that was a little bit of rubbing the salt in the wound. I don't know, because to me, he clearly isn't cool with an open relationship. And at this point, we have found out that she was the one who initiated it. So I'm guessing that maybe in order for him to stay with her, that's what, that's what the deal had to be. So, please hold. Then he says he saw a woman who looked panicked. I wasn't doing anything anyway, so I pulled up by her and asked if she needed help, Christensen tells the agents. Shortly after she got in the car, he says he assumed he misinterpreted her directions. She started really freaking out. She was grabbing her hair. Now, this is, in my opinion, this is what he's trying to do with this, as he's trying to place Ying Ying's DNA in his car, you know, because he's probably lying about all of this. The, the agents tell Christensen they're still waiting on the GPS data to come back from his car. He sounds confused or that he didn't know the car had GPS. The agents tell him it's an OnStar type system and it will take a few days to process it. They tell him this because he wants his car back and they want him to tell them what route he took. See how he's just getting caught in this? I mean, this is literally somebody who was like, I think I'll kill someone today. No forethought. I mean, no forethought. You know, and again, thank God. Eventually, the conversation shifts to why he went to the store on June 12th. Something in my apartment was smelling, Christensen says, mentioning he went to buy Drano and baking soda. He says the sink was clogged. I wonder what it was clogged with. The agents ask him about the duffel bag. Christensen tells him it contained a cat tree he bought as a gift for his girlfriend. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh -huh, uh -huh. But he says he discovered it was broken. So he left it either near the sidewalk or put it in the passenger seat of the car. I mean, this is just convoluted. He says he doesn't actually remember or know where the bag went. This is a freaking nice duffel bag, he says. It was relatively new. I mean, I can just hear it. I mean, this y'all, this guy. The interview video is paused. In the courtroom, Carter testifies that he and special agent Catherine Tena, Tenaglia met with loss prevention staff of Walmart. If we find out that this guy shot with Walmart on top of it, y'all, <laughs> I mean, just, just call me done. He says they checked every single purchase of a cat tower at the Walmart stores in Champaign, Urbana, and Savoy over the last 60 days and match each one with surveillance video. They did not find Christensen in any of those instances. And let me tell y'all what, that's some tricky surveillance stuff right there. Never, if you are committing a crime, Walmart is the last place you need to claim to have been or go. I mean, honestly, I don't know why people do that. It, I, it blows my mind every time. Anyways, the video starts playing again. Christensen tells the agents uh, that he cleaned out his car. He says he nicked his finger, causing him to bleed in the car. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. In court, Carter testifies that the FBI didn't actually recover any blood from the Astra. Okay. Uh, back in the video, Christensen talks about how working out is a passion he shares with his wife and that he works out at the refinery gym. He tells the agents he needs his computer back so he can apply for jobs. Uh, 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 uh. See, I mean, that's just, you know, I mean, he's really just grabbing onto anything he can. Uh, talking again about giving Zong a ride, Christensen says, I don't know why I did it. I, saying it was out of character for him. At the end of the video... Uh, Christensen reiterates he's there trying to sort things out. I know how it looks, he says. That's why I'm so terrified. That's why I'm here. Look, I don't know. I know I didn't do it. If something was found, I would be in jail right now. The fastest way is to find her. So she's found. This is all over. Judge Shadid then calls for a quick break. The judge even was like, I'm done. I'm done. I need a break. Um, so let's just make some commentary because it breaks into two parts right here. 
And this is the part that I think is very interesting. So he's had time to go back and start piecing his story together. So you see where, you know, at first he has no, he didn't know this girl, didn't do anything. And then all of a sudden he remembers, oh, well, wait, I did give a girl a ride. I didn't know it was the missing girl, though. And you see how he's trying to say, like, oh, she was pulling on her hair. She was doing all this stuff. So he's, he again, he's had time to start piecing a story together, which each part of it falls apart with technology i mean they have the car and they're like well no we have your gps we can tell where you went and he's like what what gps you know uh, went to walmart bought a cat thing no nope. walmart says no nope. didn't go there so it, it's just all coming to pieces here but you see, also see this last line i know how it looks that's why i'm so terrified that's why i'm here i know i didn't do it if something was found i'd be in jail right now so he's trying to get information out of them he's trying to gets about now remember all during this he knows th that he killed this woman so this is him just so brazen so let's continue uh we go to the next section the defense raises another issue uh defense attorney julie brain tells the judge the prosecution statement statements of christensen's claim 12 other victims are extremely problematic they can't leave this now here's my thing with the defense and again i will say this i understand that it's the defense's job to try and keep this man off death row or to get them off their charges or whatever the case may be to make the best possible outcome for their client that's a good way to say it please hold <clears throat> we're drinking mocha this morning and i just had to put it in my coffee cup and it's so good so but the defense keeps coming at this 12 other victims and i'm just like well, you know what it's your client who wanted to brag about killing 12 people 13 including this poor unfortunate girl it's clear there's no evidence you know he all the evidence is showing he wanted to go down in history as something and a serial killer was the easiest thing for him to do but he really couldn't even pull that off so let's continue uh she argues there's no sense in the government presenting the case as if he may have committed other murders when we all know he didn't. Well, I don't think that they're doing that, but we can see as they go. Uh, Judge Shadid, and I could be mispronouncing this judge's name, I apologize. Uh, he works with both legal teams briefly on crafting wording of instructions to the jury to clarify how the issue should be interpreted in evidence. So the judge is not going to do a mistrial for this. They've been preparing for a couple of years. Everything's lined up. The defense is just grabbing it. I mean, and again, for the defense... The situation is, you know, first of all, dot their I's, cross their T's, because there's going to be many appeals in this process. But secondly, you know, to extend, extend, delay, 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 because at the end of the day, they could get, you know, possibly, say the judge did that, and it was like, look, just offer a deal of life without parole. See where I'm going with that? Like, they kind of hope for that thing. A lot of times in these court cases, when you prolong them, now this one's a little bit different just because of the you know he's admitting he did it that type thing but a lot of times you know witnesses uh go away for whatever reason they move they don't want to be involved anymore people retire people die things like that so a lot of these cases when you see they just get put off and put off and put off you know that's a, a, a tactic the defense uses and i just think that the defense is trying to do it in this and it's not going to work so now we return back to michael carter testimony part two so after the break uh, and after so they took a break then the defense tried to get another mistrial. It's not going to happen. You know, they're saying, like, look, this wording's not proper. Now we're back with Michael Carter, testimony part two. So the jury comes back into the courtroom. Michael Carter's still on the stand. Uh, he testifies that agents took Christensen for a ride. And they first went to the site where Zong was abducted. And they have him tell them where he would have gone next. So Carter says Christensen told them he went north on Goodwin, then took a left on Beslan, and says Zong would have gotten out somewhere around there. So, I mean, the whole time he's in this car, he knows exactly what he did. He is making this up, and he's basically saying that she freaked out and got out of the car at some point. So, and now the court is shown a Walmart receipt as a piece of evidence along with surveillance video of christensen at the register and he's buying he so he's seen buying the swiffer pads and the drano and food storage possibly containers uh carter says they search for other places for evidence such as a, a park near montecillo and the defense is not cross-examined carter now notice the defense has not been really cross-examining any of these people so i'm very curious to see a, you know, is this a tactic or why are they not? Or is it just something where they don't feel any need to? It could be as basic as that. Okay, now the next person up is Andrew Huckstat. 
Now, Andrew Hugstat says he's a special agent with the FBI, and he says he became involved in Zog's abduction, uh, the abduction case, on June 12th. He says he asked Michelle Christensen for an interview. Now, remember, that was um, Brent Christensen's wife at the time. Uh, he asked her for an interview and consent to search their apartment, which she agreed to. And during their search, Hugstat says Michelle mentioned in passing that Christensen's favorite book is American Psycho. If you have not seen that movie, A, run out right now and watch it. If you want to see, like, a dark, I don't even want to say, I mean, it's a dark film, but a, a little sliver into what a an American psycho narcissistic person operates on in a fiction way, go watch that movie. Christian Bale's in it. Thank me later. So, let's continue. The defense objects to that as hearsay, but the judge allows the line of questioning to continue. Hugstat details how agents seized external hard drives, cell phones, laptops, uh, computers, keys, sunglasses, driver's license, debit cards, all sorts of stuff. Um, the court is, and so the court gets ready. They're about to show a video of Christensen in a counseling center. Uh, the defense raises an objection to it being shown, and the jury is recessed. Uh, now, Assistant Federal Defender Elizabeth Pollack says they haven't seen the clips of the video the government is about to play and argues that the way the clips are cut up could portray Christensen in a prejudicial manner. Therefore, she says the defense wants the entire video to be played. And the judge rules that the government can play their clips, but the defense will be allowed the chance to play the entire video later. So on this, I can agree because I think that, you know... It depends on what it is. I've seen some where the defense argues that they want like a, a, a twenty-minute pre thing done of the room just being shown on video because they want the whole thing to be shown, and it's just ridiculous. There's no reason to show it. But I do agree that it's like no. I think the defense needs or the defense, the jury needs to see the whole thing in context if he's in it talking. So there is no question. You know, dot your eyes, cross your t's. So the jury's called back in. Uh, the video everyone was about to watch is hard to understand. There's no transcript for it, which isn't that the case in a lot of these things where it's just like, you know, okay, it's useless now. Uh, they, they try to use headphones to get it, uh, but there's technical difficulties. The headphones are dead, so it's just an all-around fail. Uh, but the video does show Christensen talking to a counseling staff member. Uh, I've always been interested in the bad guys, he tells her. He says he developed an interest in Ted Bundy. He's literally the worst person I've ever heard of, Christensen says, next to myself. Uh, Christensen also makes comments about his own intelligence. Uh, as time progressed, I realized that although I'm smart, uh, I'm not a genius, he said. And the counseling staff member asked him for how long his par his plans were as far as whether he'd commit a crime. L let me repeat this. And the counseling staff member asked him how far along his plans were as far as whether he'd commit a crime and if he had any specific people in mind. So it, it, clearly he's planning on committing a crime. And now this is where, it's side note here, her parents have a lawsuit against him and the two counselors at school that he talked to. I guess there's two counselors he dealt with. And we're starting to see why that lawsuit's probably very much a good idea. So, okay, let's get back into it. Not specific people, Christensen tells her. There's probably a type I would look for. In the courtroom, Huckstat says Christensen's girlfriend, Tara Bullis, remember, not his wife, but his girlfriend, was cooperative during her first interview with the FBI. During the FBI's second interview with her, Hugstat says she let agents have a copy of her text messages. Remember, this is the girl that wore a wiretap. Uh, Hugstat says Bullis recorded nine conversations for the FBI over the last weeks of June seven of June 2017. Two of those conversations were the phone, and seven of them were in person. He says that he used a, he says she used a device about half the size of a sticky note. Uh, the government presents the device and they show you know the jury the device. Uh, and, and then Hugs had to, goes into talking about how Christensen's been under you know twenty four hour surveillance at this point, and basically that they continue that surveillance once they seize that Astra and got a warrant for his apartment. Uh, the courtroom has played a recorded phone conversation between Christensen and his girlfriend, and Christensen tells her tells her he would love to wake up to an essay and then calls her my kitten. So a second recording is played, and this is of an in person conversation. And Christensen explains that he's going back to the FBI to do a second interview with them because 
I'm trying to clear my name, he says. Bullis tells him, everything I get, and wait, hold on. Bullis tells him, everything I get something to eat, I get sick because of everything that's going on. Christensen later says, I'm still free, right? But that truck down there is the thing following me. I mean, just taunting him. Mean, he's very proud of this, y'all. Very proud. He then calls it amusing it, that he noticed he was being followed and said they could follow him all they wanted. So now remember, he has not told, and he refuses to say where the body is. So he has done something with this body, y'all, that only that he knows. And he is very confident about it. But he was also very confident about the committing the crime that he literally laid a breadcrumb trail out back to himself. So maybe they'll find the body. I don't know. Uh, but let's continue. So I'm glad you're laughing about it, Bullis tells him. Hugstat explains to the jury that the FBI had remained rather overt in their surveillance so they could monitor Bullis' safety. Yeah, he's like, yeah, we meant to do that. Uh, but I mean, again, it's like, I mean, they know, they know this guy's a killer and so they don't know what direction this is going to take. You know, what if he gets that she's trying to record him? I mean, this guy's crazy. So another recorded conversation shows Christensen calling FBI, special agents, Catherine Teneglia wanting to meet again to clear everything up. So this is him initiating the second thing. He wants to clear things up. Obviously he's come up with some stories. He thinks are good. Uh, and they play another recorded conversation between him and his girlfriend. Uh, I don't want you caught up in this any more than you have to be, he tells her. Bullis says, Michelle mentioned some sort of bag last night, and I don't know what she's even talking about. So that's the duffel bag that he is claiming he took to her house. Christensen tells her it was a cat tower, a present for her. That's so random, Bullis says. Christensen tells her he left it outside somewhere and had no idea where it was. I mean, really? I mean, just some of this. I mean, you see how the you see how these people do. Even the people that are in their life, they're trying to manipulate and lie to. And like her, she's like a cat tower. Like, how random is that? You know what I'm saying? So Michelle told the FBI everything about me. He told her, and that scares me too. He he later is recorded saying they don't have a damn thing. They're searching for something that doesn't exist. He at that point he tells Bullis he was just trying to help us help Michelle and help find this girl. I, what a wonderful guy he is. Uh, another recording is played in court, and Christensen says Michelle read a news article and frantically started texting him, wondering if something had happened to him. Christensen later told Bullis the car was a false lead. Uh, Michelle thinks they're trying to turn us against one another. One of them says. So see these conversations now. Remember, it gets—I mean, for me, it gets a little confusing because I'm like, okay, wait, Michelle's his wife thinks they're trying to turn us against one another. So there's all these conversations going on between all these, you know, partners and stuff. Uh, Christensen complains to Bullis about the fact that the FBI took his shoes, saying he wants his shoes back. I, I mean, this guy is just—I mean, because again, just he knows that he killed her and he's being inconvenienced by his shoes. I mean, really. So, uh, so at this point, Hugstat's still on the witness stand. Uh, the government shows the courtroom several pictures and video clips of Christensen and his girlfriend attending Ying Ying Zong's walk and concert on the UI campus on June 29th, 2017. So, you know, he's in their arm around her. They went to this thing. And it, isn't that what a lot of killers do? They return. They want to kind of see what's going on or whatever. So this part's just so eerie to me. Uh, Huxtat says Bullis also recorded their conversation during that walk. And before approaching Brent, Bullis tells the recording device that he had an alcoholic drink with him. This is ridiculous, she says at the end. At some point, Bullis asks if they're going to the concert. Going to the concert, that's also for me, Christensen says. This is between me and you. Much of the recording is almost impossible to understand, but with the aid of a transcript, certain parts are easier to hear. Keep in mind, I haven't admitted anything Christensen says to her. Just wanted to see how many people were here for me. So, I mean, he thinks that this is for him. I mean, this is how narcissistic this guy is. Uh, after a brief pause, the second recording is played to the courtroom. And the following are experts. They basically have just done some transcripts here. So, I'm going to say the girlfriend and Brent. So, uh, the girlfriend. Would you really let me do things with you? Do you always make them disappear? Now, this is broken up. You got away with it? And then he says, I didn't get away with it yet. So she's egging him on getting this information out, and 
I mean, it's, and again, this is all broken up here. Uh, at some point, Bulla says she doesn't want to take an Uber home and prefers to walk. Uh, okay, the girlfriend speaks again on the transcript. My version of safer is walking at night with a serial killer. BC says, the boyfriend, yeah, that's me. Nobody knows what happened except for me. So he's getting off on this. And it almost sounds like she, I wonder if she played into this before all this went down. Okay, he says, she was valiant. The girlfriend asked, did she fight? She fought more than anyone else I've ever met. She was stronger than any victim I've ever had. I mean, really? I had to decide if I was going to literally knock her out or kind of let her hands in front of her. Surprising. It was shocking, truly. I mean, this is just heinous, y'all. Uh, Christensen also describes how this is about my legacy. Remember, he wants to go down a history for this. Uh, he says, Ying Ying is the only person that has produced evidence that leads back to me. Number 13. I've been at this since I was 19. So, I mean, to him, this is so cool. Uh, they have the bat that I hit her head with. Christensen is recorded saying he tried to choke Zong to death for 10 minutes and that she wouldn't die. Uh, then he says, I got the bat and I hit her on the head as hard as I could and it broke her head open. At that point, I didn't know if she was dead or not, so I had a knife and I stabbed her in the neck and she grabbed for it. I chopped her head off. Some people were gone in one punch. Some people were gone in ten. I mean, the way he's describing this and the fact that he's bragging about it is what makes it even ten times worse. I'm like, and the fact that he thinks his girlfriend wants to hear it. I'm just like, are you kidding me? So now it's going into some more notes here. Uh, Christensen has heard on the recording comparing himself to Ted Bundy. He describes remembering Zong's clothes and doing stuff. He says he can never harm Bullis the same way because she's too big. It's like getting rid of 100 pounds versus 150 pounds, he said. There's a lot of extra blank to get rid of. Christensen sounds like he's bragging that the reward for information leading to finding Zong is the biggest reward Crime Stoppers has ever had. So, I mean, again, y'all, he is so proud of this. Thank God this is on video to, or on audio for the jury to hear so that they can hear what a heinous human being this is. Okay, so the girlfriend uh, transcript asks, do you think you might be the next successful serial killer? I already am, he says. I'm the most successful person who has done this in the last 30 years. I mean, y'all, it's laughable. I mean, it's not funny, but you know what I'm saying? Like, this guy is turned up. Oh, my gosh. Christensen says Ying Ying was gone and that he won't even tell Bullis where she is. I am apparently very good at this, he says. Her family are going to leave empty-handed. The video ends, and the assistant federal defender starts to cross-examine Andrew Hugstat, who's on the stand. Uh, she begins by agreeing with him that what everyone just heard was deeply disturbing. I mean, you'd have to. There's nothing else you can say about that. Uh, Pollock then asks Hugstat about the FBI's investigation into Christensen's right. Uh, recorded claim that he killed 12 other people. And Hugstat says information was sent to FBI offices in Wisconsin to see if any missing person cases could be back tied back to Christensen. Uh, and he confirms Christensen's claim is unverified. They can't really seem to find any kind of information about anything. Uh, and then Paula grills him, saying that several missing case, person cases on the list were of babies. You didn't think Mr. Christensen killed babies in Wisconsin, did you, she asked. At that moment, Judge Shadid decided to recess for the week. Court will resume on Monday at 9.15 a.m. So that's it. Uh, now, y'all, I mean, hearing this, and, and again, these criminals, because they're so proud of themselves, and this one especially, he's so proud of himself for what he's done. I mean, he is just bragging to this girlfriend. And again, I'm very curious as to why he felt this comfortable with her to brag to her in this way. It brings up some very, you know, some interest because I'm still kind of like, how does she, I mean, I get it at a certain point. She was like, something's going on with this. Maybe she reached out or during that she agreed to do all this. But I mean, it almost makes me wonder if there was some level of she knew he was going to do something because I mean, obviously this is a hobby of his. I mean, he was very fascinated with this and very proud of himself. I mean, it's just so disgusting. So, anyways, this is a very long video. If you're still watching, I greatly appreciate it. And uh, we're going to take a break, and then we're going to continue on with this case and this trial. So, I will see y'all 